see some fairly widespread icy stretches come Tuesday morning. So Tuesday morning's commute could be a bit tricky across northern and central parts. Again, expect some disruption here. But all in all, Tuesday is going to be a cold day for all of us once any early rain clears the very far southeast. A mixture of sunny spells and wintry showers, even some sleet and snow possible across the far south, but chiefly across the north as we go through the course of the day. And temperatures struggling uh, compared to recent days. But that cold theme doesn't last for too long in the south. It turns milder but wetter on Wednesday. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Welcome to what will be a very busy Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, following the fierce debate around Gary Lineker, the message is a clear one. What's the point in having borders if you don't police them? It's time to sort out this issue once and for all. In the big question, Anne Widdicombe joins me to discuss whether Jeremy Hunt should splash the cash in next week's budget. Has he got headroom? Should he look after hardworking Brits? Should he cut taxes? All of that with Anne Widdicombe shortly. Plus, in the news agenda, I'm asking, is Keir Starmer right to back Gary Lineker? And in my take at 10, as people borrow money for private operations and pay to tutor their kids at home, the public sector isn't working. Lots to get through. My big opinion next and my last final thoughts on Gary Lineker. But first, the headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Hi there, very good evening to you. Let's get you up to date with the latest from the GB newsroom. And we do start with Gary Lineker, some breaking news. Talks between 
the presenter and the BBC are thought to be moving in the right direction following a second day of disrupted sport coverage. The broadcaster says there are hopes of a resolution soon, but that not all issues have been fully resolved. Uh, Mr Lineker dodged questions from reporters earlier regarding his future. And we know the match of the day two will run for just 15 minutes tonight without pundits or commentary as fellow presenters continue to show solidarity with Mr Lineker. Uh, Five Live radio sport coverage was radically altered on both days this weekend and former uh, BBC executive Roger Bolton says the controversy is diverting attention away from the real issue. It's this argument about what is impartiality and who must be impartial that is a wider question. Of course, the other thing that's happening here is the political parties, particularly the government, governing parties, see this as a wonderful opportunity in the culture wars to create trouble and divert attention from the fundamental issue here, which is illegal immigration, which is extraordinarily difficult to deal with. The Prime Minister is currently flying to California to confirm plans to supply Australia with nuclear-powered submarines amid concern about the growing threat from China. Rishi Sunak will meet his Australian counterpart, Anthony Albanese, and the US President Joe Biden to flesh out a major defence deal as part of the 2021 AUKUS Pact. Mr Sunak is expected to unveil a new review of defence and foreign policy as well, which will set out the UK's approach to threats from Moscow. A consortium of investors led by the startup Bank of London has submitted a formal proposal for the UK arm of the collapsed Silicon Valley Bank. The bank's UK subsidiary will be put into insolvency this evening. The government says it'll do everything it can to protect UK tech firms. Companies, though, could start to experience difficulties on Monday morning. However, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, says the Treasury is working to make sure they don't run out of cash. It is the biggest failure of a US bank since 2008 and it is now under US governmental control. The health secretaries criticised junior doctors for failing to call off their strike action tomorrow. Writing in The Telegraph, Steve Barclay described the 72-hour walkout as incredibly disappointing. The British Medical Association described his comments, as well his recent offer to negotiate, as a feeble attempt to stall proceedings. It is expected to affect many services, including A&E, cancer and maternity care. And everything, everywhere, all at once is the favourite to win Best Picture at the Oscars, which gets underway shortly in Hollywood. It will face, though, stiff competition from the Banshees of Inishirin, which has an Irish record nine nominations, and all quiet on the Western Front. Bill Nye is up for the Best Actor award for his role in the movie Living, and Andrea Riseborough received a Best Actress nomination for the film To Leslie. The ceremony gets underway at midnight. Well, that's it for the moment. TV Online and DAP Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now, back to the great Mark Dolan tonight. My thanks to Aaron Armstrong, who returns in an hour's time. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. A cracker of a show tonight coming up in my big opinion. Following the fierce debate around Gary Lineker, the message is a clear one. What's the point in having borders if you don't police them? My final thoughts in what has been a sorry affair. In the big question, should Jeremy Hunt splash the cash in next week's budget? I'll be debating that with former Conservative Minister and TV personality Anne Widdicombe. And as Rishi Sunak's local authority has to upgrade the national grid just to accommodate his heated swimming pool, will his wealth lose him the next election? Do you have a problem with rich politicians? My Mark Meets guest is the maverick former Labour MP and Jeremy Corbyn critic, the man who helped expose the Rochdale grooming gangs, Simon Danchuk. He's live in the studio. What does he think of Keir Starmer and can Starmer win the next election? In my take of 10, as people borrow money for private operations and pay extra to tutor their kids at home, and with some neighbourhoods now using private policing, the public sector isn't working. It's time that taxpayers got some bang for their buck. We've got tomorrow's papers at exactly 10.30 sharp with full panel reaction and in the news agenda with Labour councillor Brendan Chilton. I'll be asking, was Keir Starmer right to back Gary Lineker? Reacting to those stories and to many more, my all-star panel of journalist and political consultant Emma Burnell, 
Historian and political commentator David Oldroyd Bolt. And former Conservative MP and now political commentator and consultant Neil Parrish. As always, I want to hear from you throughout the show. Mark at gbnews.uk. The best bit of the show is when you get in touch. And look, it's nine o'clock, so hopefully the kids are in bed. You might want to crack open a bottle of something cold and fizzy or fire up the kettle. Either way, lots to get through. Two hours of big debates, big guests and always big opinions. Let's start with this one. What a bonkers week. As a major US bank collapses, provoking fears of another credit crunch, as Brits struggle with a cost of living crisis with inflation through the roof, with a pivotal budget coming up this week, which will seal the fate of the economy for the next few years, and with a war continuing to rage in the East, having an ongoing impact on Western energy supplies, we're talking about ex-footballer and crisp salesman Gary Lineker. He's had his chips. Now, at first glance, it's a trivial story. But in reality, it's anything but. Because it has revealed how fractured the national conversation is on so many issues. And it's a drama which has severely tested the reputation of our state broadcaster, the BBC. Why? Well, for all of its strengths and weaknesses, and I think there are plenty of great radio and TV programmes that it produces, the foundation of the BBC must be impartiality. The Beeb, like Marks and Spencer, Costa Coffee and British Gas, must be a service for all. We can debate the rights and wrongs of Rishi Sunak's migrant policy, but for one of the organisation's biggest stars to create this incredible political row has created a nightmare and a headache and an existential crisis for his employer, the Beeb. And I'm not sure that helps anyone, given the fact that the BBC's revered global footprint and its outstanding legacy of television, radio, online output and film production is peerless. A talented guy, though he is, ratings for Match of the Day actually soared by half a million last night. And the brilliant Patrick Christie's and myself nicked a good few thousand viewers off him as well. Patrick, the team and I put the programme together in an afternoon. It was the alternative match of the day and it was made on a budget of 11p. Here are some <clears throat> highlights. Good evening, it's 10 o'clock and tonight we make history. This is the alternative match of the day, live on GB News with me, Mark Dolan and Patrick Christie's. Patrick, go easy on those crisps. Oh, Ahead tonight, 60 minutes of the best football reaction and the finest analysis from our top commentary team. Uh, Eamon, first of all, we're making TV and radio history. It is the alternative match of the day. Your reaction as a broadcasting legend. Aye. Well... <laughs> Aye. Well, keep, keep at it, lads. Yeah, keep at it. <laughs> keep at it. Yes, well, uh, it does appear now that this thing is working. No, it's not. Good stuff. OK, well, I will tell you. Leicester versus Patrick, Chelsea. I mean, paid? it was absolutely fantastic. Yes, it's back. Beautiful. I'll see you at the BAFTAs. Let me put it to you straight. I think Gary Lineker is a preening narcissist whose political pronouncements exist only to signal what a lovely guy he is except that his participation in the World Cup in Qatar at Stadia built by slaves, 6,000 of whom died in the 40 degree heat, and his battle with HMRC to get his tax bill down by millions of pounds sends quite a different message. And I don't think that Lineker gives two figs about the BBC, which is why he has time and again flouted their very important impartiality guidelines. You just can't force people to pay a public tax, which is what the licence fee is, for presenters on the public payroll to then wag their fingers, take sides on a complex and divisive issue like migration, and effectively demonise half the population who want something done as a bunch of heartless racists. It's my view that we must accept people who need refuge. We always have, and we should have a healthy debate about how many. But also, in my view, the illegal crossings are a humanitarian, economic and national security disaster, which cost lives, impact local communities 
and enrich unscrupulous international criminals. A knee-jerk reaction and an impulse to do the right thing and be nice in relation to the migrant crisis is really tipping your hat to the idea of an open borders policy, with no thought of the long-term consequences, particularly in relation to infrastructure, housing, school places and an NHS already on its knees. In the end, democracy will save us and this difficult issue will be settled at the next election when Sunak goes to the country. Now, Gary Lineker has his supporters, but history is a harsh te teacher. And the clamour to do the right thing and be nice during the pandemic saw the country locked down on and off for two and a half years as we paid perfectly healthy people to stay at home, wrecking the economy, borrowing half a trillion pounds and cranking up the national debt to 2.1 trillion. In my view, people were needlessly locked down, masked and subjected to vaccine tyranny, all in the name of doing the right thing and being nice. Wrecking the economy doesn't feel like the right thing now, does it? And a waiting list of 7 million people in the NHS isn't very nice, is it? On the national radio and television airwaves, I pushed back on what I considered a damaging and hysterical reaction to a potentially dangerous but largely mild seasonal respiratory virus. Well, we're seeing the same emotive clamour now in relation to the migrant crisis. Again, virtue signalling media types and politicians screaming their heads off for a more relaxed border policy, which would have serious implications for this country in the years ahead. Fair play to old Gary Lineker, though. He has at least got us having this important national conversation. But it's one that should be had on this programme and programmes like Question Time, not Match of the Day. What do you think? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let me know. Many would argue that Gary Lineker has been consistent in his humanitarian views. He has taken in refugees and uses his platform to give a voice to those who have none. In the course of this tumultuous week, he has enjoyed a massive outpouring of public support, as well as from his colleagues um, and the public. Uh, there are plenty of top lawyers also who argue that the new migrant plan is cruel, illegal, unworkable and morally wrong. Uh, so what's your view? Mark at gbnews.uk reacting to that and the big stories of the day. Historian and political commentator David Aldroyd Bolt, former Conservative MP Neil Parrish and journalist and political consultant Emma Burnell. Uh, Emma, can I start with you? Um, what do you think about this issue of being nice, doing the right thing, but not thinking through the consequences? necessarily thought through the consequences. He has a different opinion on how we should be treating migrants. That doesn't mean that he hasn't thought that we should be investing more in the systems that manage that. Um, he wrote one tweet and then one response tweet. Um, you're not going to put whole immigration policy into that. But that doesn't mean that he hasn't you know, done the reading and actually has a view. You may or may not agree with that view. But that's not to say that he's... Uh, a, he didn't really start this conversation. First of all, the government started it by putting the bill forward and they wanted to have this conversation. That's why they put the bill forward. That their conversation and the way they wanted to have it has been completely derailed by an argument of over the BBC is a question of their political management. But, um, you yeah, know, that's when the conversation started. Gary Lineker, as a citizen, joined in that conversation. That's his perfect right to do so. OK, David Aldroyd Bolt, uh, what are your thoughts about this? I feel there are parallels between uh, the clamour for lockdowns during the pandemic because that was the nice thing to do, and, and I think we're all suffering now because of that virtue signalling and the masking and all the rest of it. And I think there are parallels now with that and, and calling for an effective open borders policy uh, in relation to the channel. You're right. It's people who uh, take as their mantra, be nice, uh, because they never have to suffer the consequences of what being nice in this instance means, just as those who during the lockdown called for ever stricter lockdowns, ever stricter measures, and by and large did not have to suffer the consequences. Uh, I have to disagree with Emma uh, that Mr Lineker has a right to express his view. He doesn't. 
He is funded in his career by a poll tax. You have no option but to pay for it. And the, uh, the, the trade-off for that, that he has accepted by signing his contract, is that while he is taking the BBC coin, he will not express political views, party political views of this nature. Uh, it was in the first instance crass. It was historically illiterate, the comparison he made. So I would suggest that his reading, if it was any reading at all, was rather shallow. But in the second instance, he simply shouldn't have made it. He has not yet, to the best of my knowledge, apologised uh, for, for what he said, which was, as we say, historically crass, and he should not have made it in the first place. He's paid an enormous amount by you and by all your viewers who have televisions because they are forced by law to pay for him. He should accept this with grace. If he wants to go and campaign, and his, his uh, instincts may well be laudable, they may well be humanitarian, they may well be moral, but he does not have the right to use his platform to espouse them. He should go into the private sector and into politics if that's what he wants to do and use the many, many millions he's made from the taxpayer to put to good end in that cause. Uh, Neil Parrish, great to have you back on the show. Gary Lineker sends a tweet. He gets to prop up his brand as a really nice guy uh, without any thought for the real-world consequences of illegal migration into this country. I'm talking about towns and villages where there are migrant hotels. It's turned many people's lives upside down. Yeah, I mean, what, what offends me, Mark, with his comments is when he, he relates it back to Nazi Germany um, and what happened, you know, the Holocaust and everything that happened in Germany. That was just over-egging the pudding. Now, he can have a view. I, I'm not so worked up in having a view against uh, the policy uh, that the government's bringing in. But, of course, you know, there's many people out there who are, as you say, very concerned about what's happening. Also, you know, I mean, these criminal gangs are putting people in boats and they're drowning on the way over the channel. So we've got to send a very strong message. And yes, the language is quite tough and sometimes one feels uncomfortable with it. But in the end, we have got to try and stop those boats. And I think what we're doing now is helping. I think people are concerned with, with their, both their schooling, you know, housing, everything is under pressure at the moment. So I think it, it's madness to, to just say that we can't can't do anything about it, and if you do talk about um, the migrants, then you are wrong. And I think Gary Lineker, as has been said, is employed by the BBC, albeit on some sort of private contract where he probably reduces his tax bill. But at the end of the day, he is bound by that, and he shouldn't be. And, and, and it's a style and, and, and the way he tweeted it. And then he, he doesn't he doesn't back off, does he? You see, he just keeps going. And, and when people ask him. Because you see, he's beyond. He's so he's so popular. He feels, um, and and he's indispensable. Now, many of us in, in in both politics and the media have considered perhaps ourselves indispensable. One thing you can be certain of is we're not indispensable, okay. and that is that is I think where, where we're getting very dangerous. And yes, his his supporters will definitely say yes, carry on, Gary, because of course you know they they are following the social media, but it doesn't make it right what he's doing. And okay. there's many other people out there that don't agree with him. OK. Uh, well, we do have a developing story, which is that uh, sources are suggesting that this issue between the BBC and Gary Lineker will be resolved within the next 24 hours, uh, amicably, is what we're hearing. Uh, therefore, smart money is on Gary Lineker to return as host of Match of the Day next Saturday. Uh, your reaction, Mark, at gbnews.uk. It looks like... The comeback is on. Um, lots more to get through. At 10 o'clock in my take at 10, people are now paying to tutor their kids at home. People are using private security to police the streets and they're paying for operations privately. The public sector isn't working. We'll debate that at 10. But coming up as Rishi Sunak's local council has to update its electricity network just to accommodate his heated pool, will his wealth lose him the next election? Do you have a problem with rich politicians? Uh, but next up, looking forward to this debate. Should Jeremy Hunt splash the cash in next week's budget? We'll debate that with politics legend Anne Widdicombe. See you in two. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. 
Freeview Channel 236. And you view Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven, on Jubes and Kerr. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit. Well, off. you oh, are. Well, you, that's you, my you, you, no. My political ambitions are <laughs> those days are gone. I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes. To have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us, GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at six o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, that's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. <laughs> We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. A moving email from Jack. Hi, Mark. Ace show as always. Lockdown cost me a heart attack. I will probably die in the next few years as a result of that policy. Uh, Jack, I hope that's not the case, and I'm very glad that you were, you were alive and kicking and able to send me that email. Do stay in touch, mark at gbnews.uk, and keep your chin up, big guy. Uh, you will, uh, you'll be fine. Um, how about this from Colin? Mark, what is this nonsense about the TV licence being an unavoidable tax? I haven't had a TV for three years. Like millions of others, I stream everything, including GB News on YouTube. The Beeb is doomed. Charles says what no one, especially on the left, mentions is that these asylum seekers are fleeing a safe country, namely France. Uh, Richard, uh, Mark, regarding your big opinion, when the BBC reinstate Gary Lineker, it will give the be nice elite an extra feeling of self-importance and make them even more vicious and bold in their reign of hatred upon all of us that disagree with them. It's a depressing victory for the nasty people, thank goodness, for GB News and the People's Channel. Uh, last but not least, Bruce says, Hi, Mark, I'm struggling to pay my rent, electric, food, etc. So if illegal immigration is no longer illegal, can I now squat in Comrade Gary's house with no consequences? Uh, well put. Bruce, thank you for that. Uh, on a point of order, and we like to uh, make sure that we, we stick to the facts here on Mark Dolan tonight, uh, Gary Lineker did not talk about Nazis. Um, he said that some of the language in, in what the uh, Home Secretary, Suella Bravman, said had uh, echoes of Germany in the 1930s, and it's important to make that distinction. Now it's time for this. Wednesday sees a pivotal moment for the near-term fate of the British economy. In other words, your money and mine, or let's be more accurate, your debt and my debt. Uh, yes, it's Jeremy Hunt's March budget. 
Although the country is still counting the cost of the pandemic response and suffering a stubborn wave of inflation, which is affecting most Western economies, better than expected economic growth at the end of 2022 and into 2023, and the possible avoidance of a technical recession this year, suggests the Chancellor may have some physical headroom, some fiscal headroom with which to support hard-up Brits or even deliver tax cuts. Uh, so what do we think? That's tonight's big question. Is it safety first next week or should Jeremy Hunt splash the cash? Let's get the views of the always fiscally prudent former Conservative government minister, best-selling author and television personality Anne Widdicombe. Good evening, Anne. Good evening, Mark. And should Jeremy Hunt splash the cash in next week's budget? Well, he should certainly spend uh, in the interests of future growth. Uh, and I think what he should be spending is money on tax cuts. Uh, because without tax cuts, we can't stimulate the economy. Uh, and without stimulating the economy, growth is going to remain sluggish. Inflation is going to remain with us. Uh, and so we do need to stimulate the economy. We also need to become very competitive as a result of Brexit and take full advantage of Brexit. So I would say that he should reduce taxes, both personal taxes and business taxes, and particularly, particularly abandon any plans to raise corporation tax, which will simply drive investment out. Uh, I mean, we've already had some driven out to Ireland because, uh, you know, the, the view is um, that this is not a business-friendly environment. So he should uh, be prepared to do all those things. Now, I don't think he should go mad. I don't think he should produce a Liz Truss-type budget. I don't think he should go absolutely mad, but I think he should be guided by the principle that Britain will only thrive if it's competitive and it won't be competitive unless its tax levels are lower than its rivals. Now, Anne, on this programme, we've both spoken of the need for wage restraint in the public sector, given inflation and the budget deficit. However, is calling for tax cuts not therefore contradictory? The country's either broke or it isn't. Uh, well, I don't think um, that it is wise to spend money on uh, wage settlements which fuel inflation. That, that is the crucial thing, fuel inflation. And if you have above inflation uh, pay rises, then you create the, the well-known wage price spiral, uh, whereby people can't live faced with the sudden hike in the cost of living, so they want their prices raised, and then people can't live, etc. Uh, so that... It is not a contradiction to say we can spend money on tax cuts, but we really cannot spend money on fueling inflation. That is the point. I don't begrudge anybody a pay rise. It's when that pay rise fuels inflation that clobbers the entire country. That's Although when some, I object. Yeah, and not to interrupt you, but, but some would suggest that tax cuts are inflationary too because they stimulate the economy and therefore they create heat in the economy and that could be inflationary. Uh, no, I don't believe that that is the case, because what tax cuts actually do is they provide incentives to enterprise, uh, they provide incentives to business, um, and uh, yes, of course, I mean, people could just simply spend the money uh, that tax cuts generate, uh, but also it enables them to stay within uh, the inflation that there is at the moment. Now, if you look at Margaret Thatcher, you know, she cut taxes and cut inflation at, at, at the same time. Uh, and Anne, what about those junior doctors? Um, and what about those junior doctors, some of whom are, 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 I believe, being paid less now than sandwich makers at Pret a Manger? These are the people who are charged with keeping us alive. Uh, indeed, but actually, doctors' pay uh, is is extremely reasonable. Uh, junior doctors' pay has always been a, a, a source of. Um, of argument. But if you actually look at it, doctors, junior doctors particularly now, work far less hours than they did, um, you know, only some years ago. Uh, and therefore, and GPs are mainly part time these days. And I do mean mainly part time. Most of them are part time rather than full time. Uh, that is a statistical fact. Uh, so um, I'm not going to be um, that sympathetic to uh, putting other people in danger just as a result of their pay rise. But I would say this, I fully understand you know, that pay has fallen behind um, uh, in prices, uh, and I fully understand that people do expect at some point to get back on at least an even keel. But you can't do it 
while the country is in the grip of inflation. Because if you do, all you end up doing is pushing inflation further up. That is the whole point of large public sector pay rises. Private sector can only give pay rises when the productivity is there. When the money's coming in, then they can give it out. But the public sector is giving it out from our money, from our taxes. Uh, and it can't afford to do it at a level that pushes up inflation. I'm terribly sorry that that is just a rather grim fact of economic life. Well, that's the issue, is that pay rises in the public sector is effectively an arms race with inflation. Um, Anne, can I ask you about this uh, proposed increase in corporation tax from 19% to 25%? Um, do you think a U-turn is coming? And if not, what could the political consequences be, especially on those Tory backbenches? Well, first of all, I hope a U-turn is coming. Um, this, after all, is simply not implementing a rise rather than cutting from the base that you are at now. Uh, so, you know, um, it, it, it should be manageable. But crucially, if corporation tax goes up like that to about the level that they've got in France, this country will not be competitive. We won't attract inward investment. We won't stimulate enterprise. We won't do any of those things if we put business taxes up. And I can't understand why a conservative government, of all things, doesn't understand that. So uh, I think if, if the rise goes ahead, or even if some of the rise goes ahead, which I suspect would be a you know, sort of compromise, even if some of the rise goes ahead, it will make Britain less competitive. Um, and that is what uh, is surely the Chancellor understands, that we will only get growth, we'll only hit inflation, we'll only stimulate the economy, people will only be better off if we, the country, are competitive. And at the moment, they're doing their level best to make sure that we're not competitive. And so uh, we lose, we lose big industry to other countries. Uh, Anne, we missed you last week. Great to have you back on the show. Uh, Anne Widdicombe there. Your reaction to what the former Conservative government minister, Anne Widdicombe, has had to say? She's hoping for a U-turn in relation to that corporation tax rise. What would you like to see from Wednesday's budget market, gbnews.uk. Lots more to come. Uh, let me tell you that we've got my Mark Meets guest looking forward to the maverick former Labour MP and Jeremy Corbyn critic who helped expose the Rochdale grooming gangs, Simon Danchuk. He's live in the studio. We've got the papers at 10.30 with full panel reaction. But at next, a fascinating conversation. Rishi Sunak's local council have had to upgrade the electricity network just to accommodate his heated swimming pool. Will his money lose him the next election? Do you have a problem with rich politicians? We'll discuss that next. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage. Here on GB News, we will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh <laughs>
<laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Day. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Uh, well, a big reaction to my big opinion, which you can now find uh, on Twitter, at GB News. This from Robert. Um, Hello, good evening, Mark. In regards to the budget, I can't see the government splashing the cash. Sunak's going to America tomorrow. Who knows how much money he's going to spend there? He keeps giving money away to others. What about the taxpayer and the British people? Gregory says, uh, hi, Mark, great show as ever. Regarding the clarification that Gary Lineker did not use the Nazi word in his tweet, we can only assume he was referring to the Weimar Republic, as that was the only preceding government in 1930s Germany. Um, a fair retort, Greg, thank you for that. Um, everyone gets a right of reply on this show. Um, let's talk about the Prime Minister's wealth. Kath says, hi, Mark, I don't have a problem with the PM being rich but I do have a problem with his links to the World Economic Forum. No one should be anywhere near the levers of power uh, from that group and have any links with this sinister globalist organisation. Well, I do think uh, that's a conversation that we should be having. Uh, just these organisations, these groups, these global events uh, in which our leaders meet up and discuss our future uh, without us being democratically engaged. Um, that's certainly an important topic. But let's talk about the PM's wealth now. Rishi Sunak's new private heated swimming pool uses so much energy that the local electricity network had to be upgraded by the council to meet its power demands. It costs, on average, between 20 and £40,000 a year to heat a swimming pool, and Sunak has an estimated net worth between him and his missus of £730 million. I would say, by the way, I think the bulk of that is his wife, so he's a lucky man. But it begs the question, is wealth a problem for politicians? Does it mean that, by definition, they are out of touch? Or should rich leaders be celebrated for having made a success of their lives? It cuts both ways, doesn't it? In America, super wealthy men like Donald Trump have used their bank balance as a selling point. But here in Britain, particularly in the midst of a cost-of-living crisis, could Rishi Sunak's millions lose him millions of votes? Neil? I don't think it will, because I think at the end of the day... Not only he has a wealthy wife, but he's also actually been very good in business and he's made money um, and he's a bright man. Uh, and that's what we actually need as Prime Minister. We need actually somebody who can make the decisions and I actually think he has hit the ground running since being Prime Minister. So, yes, people will, will knock at the wealth and I understand that and people are struggling, but... Basically, lots of people out there are wealthy. So do, do all politicians... I mean, politicians have to represent everybody. So, therefore, why can't there be some wealthy politicians? There can be some poor politicians. There can be a whole mixture of politicians. <coughs> uh, and, and I think that is the issue. And I think... Uh, that, that Rishi will actually come through. And I think that, you know, what the issue is, is to make sure that the taxpayer is not paying for any of the, the cabling, uh, any of the electric, uh, but provided he is, is, is actually paying for it himself, um, then I think, you know, he's fortunate to be able to do it, but there's many out there that can. I suppose what people will ask is a man that's that wealthy, can he understand how the poorest in society are living? But I think he can, but I think it is an 
issue for him. So, yes, people will take notice of that, but I think it's, it's a great shame in a way that we've come to a, a sort of politics of envy if we're not careful. Well, you, you've, you've canvassed uh, in, in a good couple of elections, including in 2010 when you entered Parliament. Uh, you know the, the mentality of the British public, of the voters. Uh, do you think they have a problem with a rich Prime Minister? Is it a, is it a turn-off for voters? What? But what the British public don't like is is money being you know wealth being thrown around and flouted. Right. Um, I think provided you know I mean I, as a farmer I always pretend I've got no money at all, um, <laughs> which and, is increasingly and, um, true. Increasingly <laughs> true. Uh, but also you know people always say you know if it, what they don't like I don't think is people bragging about their wealth and, and throwing it around. I think sometimes you know perhaps dare I say it in some parts of the the city of London it's slightly different. Mm. But in the countryside definitely. Uh, people don't like well, but they, but I think they accept that there are wealthy people uh, and there are those that are not as wealthy. And I think what Richie Sunak and the Conservative Party will have to prove is not whether they're wealthy or not. Can they look after those that are struggling? And I think as long as he can actually get to do that, I don't think it should matter what, what his personal wealth is. I mean, is. I would personally <coughs> say that I'm quite happy for the Sultan of Brunei to be Prime Minister <laughs> as long as he or she can fix the country's problems. I don't think we're ever going to get a female Sultan of Brunei. I hate no. to break it to you, Mark. Yeah, I was trying to be a bit PC, though. <laughs> I wouldn't make it happen, but... um, Look, of the many, many reasons I think Rishi Sunak is likely to lose the next election, I don't think his wealth is, is in my top ten. Although uh, Labour will probably leverage it, won't they? I suspect they will, but they, they should learn mm. better... Um, actually, because quite often Labour's tried to do this and it's really rebounded in their faces. I remember um, a by-election in Crewe um, when they were going after... Uh, Edward the, Timpson. Yeah, Edward Timpson. And it was it was just crass and it, it, it didn't work and it completely rebounded. And Edward Timpson's actually a really interesting and very um, a humanitarian um, MP. He's not of my political mm. beliefs, but he, you know, the guy. stuff he does, he puts mm. his money where his mouth is, and that's actually what matters. Um, I don't think Rishi's wealth is the problem. I do think he's a bit out of touch, but that can be true of someone with considerably less money when you become cosseted and bubbled into this very, very, very small world. I don't think he understands the people he represents very well. And so that's why when he's talking to us, he can come across as either some sort of weird tech bro or a play school presenter uh, or a horrible mixture of the two. And it just feels very patronising. Now, you can be very, very patronising without being very, very rich. Mm. When you're both, that can be a bit of an issue. Uh, what do you think? Uh, because the issue, David, is that if, if we judge the British people to have a problem with this, then that's very patronising. Mm. To my viewers and listeners, it's the idea that we've all got a chip on our shoulder about someone that's been successful. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that is the case. We've had rich prime ministers, we've had poor prime ministers. At this point, I do think that Labour could be led by a man in a Captain Pugwash uh, uniform and still win the next election because the Tories are so consistently behind in the polls, 20% behind for you know, months and months and months now. I'm not sure that Mr Sunak's uh, wealth is the reason that he appears out of touch. That, I'm afraid, is down to his schooling. He went to a school where you were brought up, uh, brought along to believe that you're the cleverest man in every room and he is unfortunately unable to suppress that instinct and that belief. Uh, he comes across as though the rest of us are incredibly thick mm. and he has to explain everything in the simplest possible terms using the most basic language and it just makes people's backs uh, go up and their mm. shackles rise. Uh, I think there is perhaps a slight animus against people who are very rich in the country but that's always been the case with is a sort of tall poppy syndrome. But then you look at some of our great prime ministers, like Stanley Baldwin in the 1920s and 30s, who uh, famously gave a proportion of his own wealth after the First World War, a proportion of his personal wealth, to the nation to help with reparations after the war, and wrote a letter to the Times suggesting that others did the same. Uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher was pretty well off because of her husband, Dennis Thatcher's business career. Tony Blair did perfectly well. You know, I think that the trend is, because of the social class from which most politicians are drawn, mm. or have been until recently, that they'll be richer than the average person. 
to have someone of Mr Sunak's incalculable by most standards wealth is quite unusual, but I don't think it's why he's unpopular. I think that's because he comes across as a preening and arrogant uh, man who doesn't like the people he represents. Well, you're going to have to get off I... that fence at some point. <laughs> Neil, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't think that's the case at all. I think he represents the people in, in his Yorkshire constituency very well, and I think they actually very much like him. Uh, I think um, Labour would be very unwise to target his wealth because, um, I mean, there are some Labour politicians that are quite wealthy too. So, you know, one has to be careful. Including with this. Keir Starmer, who I, I, yeah. I understand to be on paper a millionaire. Mm. Well, it'd be surprising if he weren't. He well, if he owns a house in North London, yeah. well, he's he, almost he, certainly. Uh, and he was yeah. a top, top lawyer. Yeah. Top Surely he's also a barrister, years. isn't he? Yes, so, so, I mean, he didn't come I have never never seen too many poor, poor, too, too many poor, poor <laughs> barristers in my Spend time. Spend some time at the criminal bar and you will. <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, or a solicitor, because they're not paid that much, actually. No, that's, <laughs> that's a very fair point. They're looking for a pay rise like everyone. Um, listen, I should add, by the way, that although the local authority had to do this work in relation to Mr Sunak's property, Mr Sunak is fronting the full cost. So there you go. He's paying his way, folks. Uh, but let's not get out the small violins. Um, lots more to come at uh, 10 o'clock in my take at 10. People are now paying to have their children privately tutored. They're borrowing money for operations because the NHS waiting list is so long and some communities are using private police forces. The public sector isn't working. We'll talk about that in my take at 10. My Mark Meets guest is Maverick, former Labour MP and Jeremy Corbyn critic. A man who helped expose the Rochdale grooming gangs, Simon Danchuk, live in the studio. What does he think about Keir Starmer and can he win the next election? Uh, lots to get through, folks. Uh, but next up, we'll talk to another well-known voice from Labour about whether Keir Starmer was right to support Gary Lineker this week. We'll discuss that next. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess that I've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes now. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. 
We're proud to be GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Uh, Alan has said uh, it's not uh, it's not Rishi Sunak's wealth um, that's the issue. It's envy. Love to know Blair and Brown's wealth made from politics at the expense of working men. Uh, let's uh, return uh, to that conversation after 10 o'clock. Sakir Starmer this week defended Gary Lineker's rights to make comments about the government's new asylum shake-up. The Labour leader claimed that ministers were looking for other people to blame. Starmer said that although he wouldn't have chosen Lineker's words, referencing uh, Germany in the 1930s, he defended Lineker's right to save them and has argued that this is a crisis of the government's making. So is Starmer right to back Gary Lineker's intervention on this issue. To discuss this, I'm delighted to welcome a good friend of the show, Labour Borough Councillor, former head of Brexit Group, Labour Leave, and the CEO of the Independent Business Network, Brendan Chilton. Hi, Brendan. Good evening, Mark. Good to see you. Uh, good to have you on the show. It's been a divisive issue. Was Keir Starmer right to take sides? Uh, well, I come at this from uh, the starting point that I believe in total free speech. Um, and so the idea that someone should be uh, dismissed for expressing a view, whether you agree with it or not, um, I, I don't agree with. So I think Keir Starmer was right uh, to defend Gary Lineker. Um, again, I think comparisons with 1930s Germany are, are far too common uh, and they're never very helpful. Um, but I don't think uh, he should have been dismissed uh, for just simply expressing a view. Um, and, and what about the political aspect of this? I mean, Keir Starmer's playing to the base, isn't he, by supporting the spirit of what of what uh, of what Gary Lineker has said? Because you know he's used uh, these remarks by Lineker to say that this is a, a crisis of the government's making. So he has leveraged it to his own political ends. I think the majority of uh, Labour members, MPs uh, and activists would have great sympathy with what uh, Gary Lineker said. I also think actually Keir Starmer's right to point out that this is a problem of the government's making. Uh, the government have been in power now for 13 years. Uh, the migration crisis, and we all know this bill that's uh, been put to Parliament, the idea is to deal with the problem in the channel uh, specifically. Um, it's not going to go away. This bill is not going to stop people trying to make that crossing uh, across the channel. Um, and we all know uh, that even if the bill passes, the chances uh, that its, uh, its intentions going through to its, their ultimate conclusion, namely flying people to a third party, the chances of that happening are about as equal as aliens landing from the moon uh, because well, you've got to get the consent of the third country and no-one's uh, going to agree to that. <laughs> it's, it's, clearly, it's clearly complex, uh, Brendan, and it, it seems that Sunak's approach is, is multi pronged. There's no one silver bullet. I mean, you could argue they're all rubber bullets. But um, what would you say to many of my viewers and listeners to Mark Dolan tonight who are ex-Labour voters in the Red Wall who want to stop the boats? And as far as they can see, that's what Rishi Sunak's trying to do. And as far as they can see, Keir Starmer's trying to block this policy by backing Gary Lineker. Well, I think um, first thing to say is, of course, uh, Rishi Sunak's been prime minister for a few months. We've had successive uh, Tory prime ministers that have claimed they're going to stop the boats and have failed. Um, I think the way we need to deal with this, uh, I think both parties, frankly, need to stop using this as a political football and say, where is this problem starting? And it's starting in North Africa and in the Horn of Africa. People are fleeing from that region uh, and coming to the UK, mostly men, uh, because the area is impoverished, there's drought, etc. We also know that Europeans are not doing their job to stop them crossing the Med, and European nations uh, are not stopping them in their own countries. So, and frankly, they've got, we need they've to got, deal with... They've got free movement, they've got the Schengen, which doesn't exactly. help, does it, Brendan? Which is, of course, why you founded... Labour leave, because you are a, a right-blooded right, right. Brexiteer. Um, just a very short moment to bring my panel in. David Aldroyd Bolt, Neil Parrish and Emma Burnell. Brief comments from each of you, starting with you, David Aldroyd Bolt. Well, in this drama, in this uh, great debate, Keir Starmer has picked a side and he's picked Gary Lineker. 
Can one help but be cynical and detect a trace of hypocrisy in Mr Starmer's comments? I think had Mr Lineker come out and said, send in the Mediterranean fleet and put a gunboat there, anybody who tries to come across into the Med or uh, in the Channel should be shot where they stand, I think perhaps Mr Starmer might have been a little slower to leap to his defence and perhaps also many of his BBC colleagues. The, the simple fact is that this is, has nothing to do with the substance of Mr Lineker's remarks and everything to do with the conditions of his employment as a contractor of the BBC he shouldn't have said it, he should apologise, and Starmer's being hypocritical in saying anything otherwise. Emma, Emma Revel, you are shaking your head. You want a Labour government. Um, I've got lots of viewers and listeners to this show who are previous Labour voters who backed Boris in 2019 because they wanted to get Brexit done. They want to stop the boats because they think it's a national security, economic and humanitarian disaster. And basically, Keir Starmer is calling them racists by backing uh, uh, Gary Lineker. No, he really, really isn't. And let's be very, very clear. Your viewers who feel that way are not racist. There is a perfectly reasonable position to be taken about wanting to stop the boats, wanting to break the business model of the people traffickers, but also being in favour of us being an open and welcoming country for refugees. Those are not incompatible. What we have is a system that is not managing to deliver that. What Gary Lineker has said is that we have a system that is absolutely fundamentally failing to, to be compassionate and fair and workable. Um, Gary Lineker is supposed to be impartial in his job, not on his Twitter account. And also, I'm not being funny, but I happen... Look, I know nothing about football, really, very, very little. And I know that Gary Lineker is a massive supporter of Leicester City. I know that Ian Wright's a big Arsenal fan. So... They are talking Im unimpartially about the things that they are there to professionally talk about all the time, and we've never had a problem with it. OK. So, come on. OK. All right, fair enough. Look, uh, feelings are running high. Brendan, great to see you. Come and see us in the studio again. Uh, it'd be great to have you back on the panel. Uh, my take at 10 is next. The public sector isn't working. Find out why next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News.
the People's Channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. It's 10 o'clock and this is Mark Dolan tonight. It might take at 10 as people borrow money to pay for operations and parents pay for their children to be tutored at home. The public sector isn't working. My Mark Meets guest is the maverick former Labour MP and Jeremy Corbyn critic who helped expose the Rochdale grooming gangs, Simon Danchuk. Plus, tomorrow's front pages at exactly 10.30 sharp with full panel reaction, lots to get through. But my take at 10 first, after the headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Hi there, I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Talks between Gary Lineker and the BBC are moving in the right direction following a second day of disrupted sport coverage. There are hopes of a re resolution soon, uh, but not all issues are fully resolved at this stage. That is according to BBC News. Uh, football coverage on TV and radio was hit across the weekend as pundits walked out in solidarity with Lineker after he was taken off air for criticising government asylum plans. Sunday's edition of Match of the Day will run for a reduced 15 minutes without commentary or analysis. Former BBC executive Roger Bolton says the controversy is diverting attention away from the real issue. It's this argument about what is impartiality and who must be impartial that is a wider question. Of course, the other thing that's happening here is the political parties, particularly the government, governing parties, see this as a wonderful opportunity in the culture wars to create trouble and divert attention from the fundamental issue here, which is illegal immigration, which is extraordinarily difficult to deal with. The Prime Minister is on his way to California to confirm plans to supply Australia with nuclear-powered submarines amid concerns about the growing threat from China. Rishi Sunak will meet his Australian counterpart, Anthony Albanese, and the US President Joe Biden to flesh out a major defence deal. It's part of the 2021 AUKUS Pact. Mr Sunak's expected to unveil a new review of defence and foreign policy, which will set out the UK's approach to threats from Moscow. A consortium of investors led by the start-up of Bank of London has submitted a formal proposal for the UK arm of the collapsed Silicon Valley Bank. The bank's UK subsidiary will go into insolvency this evening. The government says it will do everything it can to protect UK tech firms, uh, but warns that companies could start to experience difficulties on Monday morning. However, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, says the Treasury is working hard to make sure they don't run out of cash. It is the biggest failure of a US bank since 2008 and is now under US government control. The health secretaries criticised junior doctors for failing to call off this week's strike action. Writing in The Telegraph, Steve Barclay described the 72-hour walkouts as incredibly disappointing. Members of the British Medical Association in England will launch a three-day strike on Monday. The union says junior doctors in England have suffered a 26% real terms cut to their pay since 2009. And Everything Everywhere All at Once is the favourite to win Best Picture at the Oscars, which gets underway shortly in Hollywood. Uh, the film, though, will face competition from the Banshees of Innes Sharon, which is earned an Irish record nine nominations and All Quiet on the Western Front. Bill Nye is up for Best Actor for his role in the movie Living and Andrea Riseborough has received a Best Actress nomination for her role in the film To Leslie. That's it for the moment here on GB News. Now back to Mark Dolan tonight. My thanks to the brilliant Aaron Armstrong. One day he will tell me how he gets his hair like that. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. It is five past ten and we've got a lot to get through. My Mark Meets guest is the maverick former Labour MP and Jeremy Corbyn critic, a man who helped expose the Rochdale grooming gangs, Simon Danchuk. We'll hear from Simon very shortly. Plus, tomorrow's papers at exactly 10.30 sharp with full panel reaction. But first, my take at ten.
The public sector isn't working. Following a report by the excellent social mobility group, the Sutton Trust, it seems that private tutoring is now adding to the class and socio-economic divide. Here is the devastating verdict of educational author and consultant Joe Nutt, who said this week, people are flooding to pay for private tutoring and mentoring because between them, the teaching unions and the state demonstrated just how disinterested in and incapable they are of educating children during the pandemic. More and more parents now know this. But it's not just education. Faced with a waiting list of 7 million people thanks to the delightful policy of lockdowns, members of the public are now dipping into savings and even borrowing money to have operations the NHS say are non-urgent or will have to wait. Well, if it's affecting your work or your quality of life, it sounds pretty urgent to me. So the public are resorting to the private sector and therefore effectively paying twice for the treatment that they need. Some neighbourhoods are now employing private police forces because there just aren't enough bobbies on the beat to keep the area safe. The list goes on. Expensively tasked with providing public services, the public sector is all too often not delivering bang for its massive buck. And I fear for the relationship between citizen and state, which has already had a kicking during the pandemic, thanks to the government's illiberal COVID response. Whether it's our health service, policing or education, I worry that these once great institutions will become like the BBC, something we all have to pay for, but which only a portion of the population actually use. The size of the state is enormous, inflated, of course, by COVID. That set the tone, the template for a bloated government responsible for every aspect of your life, costing you a small fortune with the second highest taxes since the war. All for a service which gets more expensive but worse by the day. The cost goes up, the quality goes down. The public sector isn't working. I want my money back. Now, what do you think? Many would argue that the public sector has suffered decades of underinvestment and the chickens came home to roost during the pandemic. Many in education and the NHS argue that poor pay means that recruitment and even hanging on to staff is all but impossible. So is it down to lack of investment or is there a structural issue at play? Mark at gbnews.uk. Uh, reacting to that, I'm delighted to welcome historian and political commentator David Oldroyd Bolt, former Conservative MP Neil Parrish and Conservative... Uh, she's definitely not a Conservative. She's a journalist <laughs> and political consultant. She's a proper lefty. It's Emma Burnell. Uh, Neil Parrish, the state is too big and the public sector isn't working. I think as far as the health service is concerned, we, we are spending, what, nearly 50% on administration. That's what we have really got wrong, and successive governments got that wrong, and, and this, this Conservative government's got it wrong. And so, therefore, it's making sure that you do actually get the, the, the actual staff and the pay out to the sharp end, and that's where we do really have a problem. And people are actually, you know, voting with their feet. They are actually going for the private sector, and, and why shouldn't they if the state can't provide. But of course, what we mustn't do is abandon the state and abandon the systems. And we've got, you know, very many good teachers, we've got very many good doctors uh, and nurses. But it but the systems we've got in place are letting them down, actually, as well as letting the public down. So I think that is the issue for me, and I think we can actually do a lot better. But we are living... It's interesting, although we have a Conservative government, we are actually living in a socialist time. And what I mean by that is the state will provide. Whatever happens now, the state provides. And the trouble is, the state could provide if it was from taxes, but it provides mainly from borrowing, or not mainly from borrowing, a lot from borrowing. And I I think that's the real issue for us and, and we've got to get to grips with what, what we're spending uh, and also <laughs> delivering a service. And I am worried about private police forces in particular. Um, you know, perhaps that's over-egging the pudding, but I think that can actually get really out of hand. But as far as people having their, you know, I've got a hip, for instance, that, that needs doing, I'll probably have to cough up for that because otherwise, you know, I'll, I'll be sort of crawling around the ground before 
the health service will, will actually do it. So, you know, those are the sort of things that people will take those decisions. And are they wrong to take them? I don't think they are. So what we've got to be careful as a society is that we don't then sort of turn on people because they're going for private health care. Uh, but we really do have to sort out the state system and the government hasn't sorted it out and there's much more to be done. Um, Emma, we love our doctors and nurses. They do a great job, um, a lot of goodwill, a lot of hard work. And, of course, they're very skilled. But it's the infrastructure around our nurses and doctors, the infrastructure <coughs> around our teachers, the infrastructure within policing. Uh, I just worry that as more and more people resort to the private sector, it brings the public sector into disrepute. You know, it becomes like the Beeb. You're paying for a service you don't actually use. Well, I would uh, dispute the bee being um, in disrepute, although it's in a slight disarray at the moment, certainly. Um... Well, Emma, just, just on a point of <clears> order, <throat> uh, lots of people have to pay for the bee who don't watch it or listen oh. to it. Yes and no. Uh, we all... The knock-on of good journalism, good entertainment programmes is felt by people who aren't sitting down to watch well, them. How, how does that happen? Osmosis? Yes, in many ways, actually. Good journalism... Uh, it informs us all and informs the political debate that we have, whether we're watching it on the channel or whether we just feel the benefit of that debate being had. So you don't have to have watched Newsnight so to BBC see the impact that it might have. The BBC is good for you, even if you don't watch it or listen to yes, it. Yes, a public service broadcaster is great for all of us and, and really vital, and we know this because we've seen what happens in America. Um, but well, on, Neil, on, well, on well, the... Moment, before we get to the, to the yeah. meat and two veg, uh, Neil, you don't look happy. No, because I think that the trouble is with the BBC is that the younger generation just aren't watching it. Um, and so, therefore, you're, you're sort of getting a, a, a sort of smaller and smaller core of people watching the BBC, and it's great to have it, but it's not an institution that's actually as broad as we think it is, and, and that is the real problem. You know, I talk about you know, my children um, and certainly grandchildren coming on, they, they don't actually watch the BBC. They go onto their computer, they go onto their phones, that's how they get their news. Uh, it's very rarely the BBC that they're watching. And so I think, you know, the BBC does have to be careful to make sure that it's relevant as it goes forward. I'm not against the BBC. I think in many ways they do a good job, but they are losing the generations. Well, and I don't well, know what they do about okay. it. Okay. And so, so really, Emma, you know, the, the wider point, and I acknowledge what you said about the ecosystem of the media and the BBC's contribution to that. I understand they do have a legacy of great broadcasting. I, I mentioned that in my big opinion. Uh, but I, I just think that it could go that way when it comes to the NHS that, yes, we love the nurses and doctors, but if that many people are borrowing money on a credit card to get a new knee, people will get disaffected with the NHS and, and they will hold it in, in a dim light. I don't think that's we're in danger of that at the moment. We talked earlier about whether Rishi Sunak's wealth is going to be what loses him the next election. A seven million waiting list for the NHS is going to be what loses Rishi Sunak the next election. If he can't get a grip on that, then they are in really, really big trouble. I think the public have maintained their love of teachers and nurses and doctors and public sector workers. We are a country that believes in state provision of a lot of things. Um, we argue around the margins of mm. that. Um, myself and Neil and David <laughs> will have very different opinions about where the margins mm. of that are. But we, in general, agree with some pr state provision of things. Um, when that provision is being so badly run, that's when politicians lose their grip. And that, I think, is where the biggest danger for the Conservatives is. OK, well, look, uh, the issue is, David, that lots of people are paying twice now for public services, once through the state, through their taxes, and again through the private sector. This doesn't end well. No, and at some point we've got to get over our national delusion that the antiquated and unfit-for-purpose National Health Service is in any way going to sustain an ever-growing nation with ever more complicated health problems. Mm -hmm. uh, Look, we have to make a decision. Are we a country which will have health provision or are we a country that exists to fund the National Health Service? I would prefer that we are the former and that we look to other countries around the world for good functional models of where public and private health systems cooperate to provide the very best health care for its citizens at the very
very lowest price and that uh, results in the greatest health outcomes. We're not doing that at the moment. We either end up in this tedious, dichotomous debate about, well, it's either this or America, or, or we just refuse to talk about it at all. And the latter is particularly a problem, I'm afraid to say, to mm. Neil, of elected politicians who run scared from it because it's a very large question with very unpleasant David, consequences. Uh, David, can I ask you whether Labour did a better job un under New Labour and Tony Blair? Because uh, that, many would argue, was the golden era of the public sector, unprecedented investment in the NHS and in education, education, education. Well, you call it investment, I call it splurging. And we didn't get better results in education over the course of the new Labour government. Our PISA scores went down. We are a badly educated country. We are a bad, uh, we're a country in poor health. Uh, the state provision that we have clearly does not work. And now either we uh, act like a sensible country and have a debate about how far the limits of public provision can go with the amount that we're willing to be taxed, uh, or we do what we've done for the past, I don't know, okay. 70 years and stick our heads in the sand and hope that someone else comes along and makes it better magically. It's uh, not going go. to happen. Uh, your viewers studio, deserve better. To, to forgive me to interrupt you live in the studio next. My Mark Meats guest is Maverick, former Labour MP and Jeremy Corbyn critic, a man who helped expose the Rochdale grooming gangs. Uh, what a guy, what a character. He's live in the studio. Simon Danchuk is next. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit on. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. Uh, but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Uh, let's have a look at some of those uh, emails. Um, was Keir Starmer right to support Gary Lineker this week in those uh, migrant comments? Margaret says uh, he was not right. Uh, Lineker is too big for his boots and has had his day. Suck him, I say, says Margaret. Rosie Duffield, the Labour MP, was harassed by her own MPs for stating that only women can have a cervix and Keir Starmer 
said she was wrong in that assumption. So he stands by Lineker on free speech but won't stand by his own female MP. Thank you, George. Uh, and on the economy, what do you want from the Chancellor next week? Um, well, how about this? A simple message from Glenn, which I think speaks for many. Make sure that you are always better off by working. It's not so at the moment. Glenn, thank you for that. It's time now for this. Yes, it's time for Mark Meets, in which I speak to the biggest names in the world of politics, sport, showbiz and beyond. Tonight, former Labour MP and best-selling author Simon Danchuk. Simon grew up in Lancashire, where he began his working life at the age of 16 in a factory making gas fires before going back to education as a mature student. There followed a glittering career in research, public affairs and communications before he entered the House of Commons in 2010. Famously, he won the seat of Rochdale, despite a microphone picking up the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown, calling Rochdale resident Gillian Duffy a bigoted woman. Do you remember that? Well, he still won his seat. Simon was very successful in that constituency, taking his majority of just under 900 in 2010 to 12,500 five years later. The Financial Times described Simon as Jeremy Corbyn's most outspoken internal critic. And Simon gained admiration for his work and his book, Exposing Child Sexual Abuse, committed by former Rochdale MP Cyril Smith. He also helped expose the Rochdale grooming gangs who had been operating for years in the area. Following a bit of a Barney with Labour, he resigned from the party in 2017, after which he began a new career as a political commentator and author. Um, his latest book is called Scandal at Dolphin Square. It is non-fiction but reads like a political thriller. It's winning rave reviews and it's out now. Simon Danchuk, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Why politics? You're far too talented for that. Well, I enjoy uh, having an impact and helping people, and I've been a local councillor. I was a councillor in Blackburn uh, for a number of years. I got a taste for, for helping people, and, and the natural progression was to go into Parliament. OK, uh, 2010, uh, an interesting time uh, to enter the House of Commons. Um, in, in, in Rochdale, uh, what was your early experience of life in Parliament? Oh, it's an unusual place. I didn't take to it too well, actually. It's a, for a working-class guy like myself to enter that place, it is an unusual place, so it took some Does anyone show you the to... ropes? Well, you, they, they do have an induction programme, but it's inadequate, I would say. But nevertheless, it's a fascinating place and you can have a real impact. And, and, the, and the, the, first, the first sort of maybe 28, 48 hours, you know, you, you've won this seat, which is a triumph for you personally, but you're thinking, is there going to be a Labour government? Gordon Brown was holed up at number 10 That's right. in a stakeout situation, trying to broker some kind of deal, a minority agreement. It didn't happen. So, so that must have been a strange way for you to start your your parliamentary career, not knowing whether it was going to be a Labour or a coalition government. Yeah, that's right. And I remember Jack Straw ringing me up. He was ringing round uh, Labour MPs to see whether they wanted to go into a coalition with the Liberal Democrats. I'd just been fighting the Liberal Democrats tooth and nail in Rochdale and managed to beat them. So I wasn't enthusiastic about a, a coalition with the Liberal Democrats at all. And I think it was the right decision not to go with that. Indeed. Um, you fell out with uh, the man that will become leader later, Jeremy Corbyn. What's your appraisal of the damage he did to the Labour cause? Oh, massive. I, I mean, it's incredible the amount of uh, damage he did to the Labour cause. I, I've always, I was always a traditional Labour MP, traditional values, traditional uh, Labour values. Like, like a so-called, uh, like a red wall uh, sort of Labour MP? Yeah, exactly. That would be my take on it. And, and what we've got now with Kia is, and it's been replicated in years gone by, really, but Keir, uh, who is a nice person, a good person, uh, but he's what I would describe as soft left. Mm. Uh, and so he's soft on uh, illegal immigration, he's soft on dodgy benefit claimants, he's soft on law and order. And what he really will promote, and this is my concern, and it follows on from this sort of North London view of the world, where Corbyn is, where Ed Which Miliband is perhaps are. a bit woke. Well, exactly. And they uh, Kia will perpetuate that sort of agenda. Mm. And we've, we've now got 
uh, the lef left-wing establishment infiltrating public uh, institutions, our public services, and pushing this particular woke agenda. And that gives me real concern because I, I have a worry that if uh, Kia wins the next general election, then he will perpetuate that view. He will be a flag bearer uh, for, the, for the soft left, for the left-wing establishment that currently exists. Uh, yes, this is, uh, you know, obviously he, he's, he's got his, uh, his, his gifts. Um, he's ahead in the polls and he certainly got on top of the anti-Semitism scandal within the Labour Party. Uh, he's evicted Jeremy Corbyn, which I'm sure you'll support, but he also cannot define on camera what a woman is. He, will, he said that uh, saying that only women have a cervix is something you shouldn't say. Uh, I thought he was quite weak in his uh, de defence of or support of Rosie Duffield, who, who has simply been vilified by many in the Labour movement uh, for pointing out that there is a difference between the two biological sexes. Mm. Yeah, and, and this is my concern. He, he has a walk agenda and that will be perpetuated uh, should he win the general election. So people need to be really careful about what decisions they make uh, come the next general election. Well, who would you, who would you tell your ex-constituents to vote for? I, I haven't decided how I will vote mm. at the next election uh, but I, I think I will be struggling to vote for Kia and, and for that for could you for could you government. go and I'm not going to compare you directly don't worry but could you go on a sort of on a parallel journey to someone like Lee Anderson who was a Labour supporter for decades and who yeah. is now who is now uh, in the Midlands as a Conservative MP I have a lot of admiration for Lee Anderson and mm. I, I did a tweet just a few weeks ago people were being critical of him uh, being vice chairman of the Conservative Party but I, I put out a tweet saying uh, whilst I haven't decided how I'm going to vote, him becoming the vice chairman of the Conservative Party makes me more likely to vote for them, not less likely to vote for them. We need working people to have a real representation in Parliament and they, we just don't get that from, uh, from the Labour Party at the moment. I know you're really busy writing your next book, which is fiction, which I'm looking forward to. Um, would you consider, would you countenance a return uh, to, to, uh, to politics uh, and, and possibly have a run at... Uh, uh, run at uh, getting into Parliament again? I haven't really considered it. It's not something that's on my immediate agenda, that's for sure. Right, so do you, do you feel like you've achieved those ambitions and you're ready for new challenges? Or... Yeah. Is yes. it never say never, though? Well, you never say never, do you? Because you don't know how life turns out I, and yeah, what happens. I, do, I just wonder whether the party managers at the Conservative, uh, Conservative uh, Association will be... You know, central office. We're watching this now, going right. We better reach out to Danchuk. Well, that I'll let be you a know feather in do. our cap. Yeah. Well, I'll let you know if they do. But uh, I haven't had a phone call. Could like they? That could yet. they potentially court your interest? Oh, I've, I, well, I, I sympathise with a lot of what the Conservative Party stands for now. I think mm. they need to toughen up a little bit as well. There are some people in the Conservative Party who are having doubts about the small boats legislation. Mm. I just don't get that. They need to be uh, more forthright in terms of pushing a Conservative agenda. Uh, what is your appraisal of, of the, the, the deal with Emmanuel Macron? It's going to cost us half a billion over the next couple of years. Uh, and, of course, uh, legislation which will mean anybody that enters the country illegally is not granted asylum. Um, yeah, what, what's your hot take on that? I support the legislation. I think it's... Uh comprehensive. I think Suella Braverman should be credited with what she's doing in terms of the legislation. Mm. There has to be a solution. Labour aren't even offering any solutions. And I'm in no doubt that if we have a Labour government at the next general election, then they will be soft on illegal immigration. And that's just not acceptable. We have to have a solution. The idea of sending people to Rwanda, a country I know very well, uh, is an excellent policy. And if this legislation enables the government to be able to do that, then I think it should be welcome. Uh, do you think that a Labour leader with your values will be coming anytime soon? You know, I can see a scenario actually where Rishi Sunak is a little bit like John Major, where he wins the next general election. By a whisker. By a whisker, absolutely. But there are various factors at play in that. I think he could win it, uh, retain power for the Conservatives, and then it would be for Labour to change uh, from a Neil Kinnock type figure mm. uh, in, uh, in Keir Starmer to, to somebody who's more new Labour. OK, and you're writing a book, so... Um, yes. Mm, uh, it's fiction. Yes. Can you give me a flavour of the, yeah, the it's subject all, matter? It's all about politics and power and sex in the north of England. It's purely fictitious. Yeah, yeah well, listen, it'll, it'll be fascinating, right, because the, the, I had a little go. I've, I've been so busy, I haven't a chance to read uh, all of your latest book because uh, we had you on a few weeks ago when you were plugging it. But um, you've, you've had a colourful private life. 
Mm. Um, and you do been a public figure, a politician, a, a famous girlfriend that became a wife. She's your ex now. Mm. Um, but you, you, know, you were both splashed all over the papers. Was that hard for you on a personal level? It, it was at times, yeah, and I, I suffered from some depression from it. Uh, but then uh, eventually recovered and, mm. uh, and, you know, have a healthy, healthy life now. But, uh, yeah. yeah, it can be difficult to deal with. Well, let me it? tell you, you are the picture of health. And I know you've got you. four lovely kids to show for it as well. So wish you well in the family. Come back and see us soon. Thank you. There you go. Simon Danchuk there, very critical of the current uh, Labour incumbent. Uh, watch this space. Uh, lots more to come. The paper's next. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage. Here on GB News, we will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island's story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Day. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Oh, Simon Danchuk, what a fascinating interview. Ex-Labour MP not happy with Keir Starmer, says that essentially the current administration are irredeemably woke. He said that if there's a Labour government, they will not stop the boats. He dropped a few truth bombs. Uh, Tory party central office, are you watching? Um, mark at uh, gbnews.uk is the email. Keep your feedback coming. It's time for this. Yes, indeed. Tomorrow's front pages. It is the papers with full panel reaction. We start with The Telegraph and they lead with, you guessed it, it's Gary Lineker. Um, Lineker set to return as BBC bosses back down. 
Um, the corporation is expected to announce it's reviewing its guidelines on the use of social media in the wake of the controversy. In return, it's believed that Lineker will agree to be more careful about how and what he tweets. He may also make some form of apology. Sunak gives military a £5 billion boost to face down Russia. The Prime Minister will uh, tomorrow pledge to boost military funding to 2.5% of GDP in the long term as well, significantly less than the 3% uh, that was offered and promised by Liz Truss. OK, next up, let's go to the Metro now. So many headlines to look at, folks. Uh, let me tell you, we're, we're swimming in news tonight. Lineker muzzled for now. Outspoken match of the day host refuses to talk. Uh, cut down BBC football show gets more viewers. Um, but there you go. The mood music is that it looks like, uh, looks like Lineker will be back on match of the day on Saturday. Uh, the Guardian next. BBC bosses in race to end Lineker's standoff and avoid staff rebellion. Silicon Valley Bank crisis pushed to save UK startups. The government was trying to secure an emergency support package tonight to protect Britain's tech and life sciences sectors from major losses after the collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank in the United States as financial markets braced for further volatility following the biggest bank failure since 2008. PM upgrades power grid to heat up his, his private pool is another story. Uh, Chloe, where would you like to go next? Uh, Daily Mail now. Uh, will BBC do Lineker deal today to send TV... Excuse me. To, will the BBC do a Lineker deal today to end TV standoff? Uh, that's the question. Also, uh, is it fun at the Oscars? Lily, of course it is, say the Daily Mail. Uh, the Independent now. Hunt pledges help for UK tech firms at... Serious risk after collapse of top US bank. BBC's urgent talks with Lineker to prevent another weekend of chaos and revealed the £1 billion apprenticeship ripoff. More than a £1 billion worth of taxpayers' money has been used to fund thousands of courses for top executives that are equivalent to a master's degree but based, uh, sorry, badged as apprenticeships. Um, the Independent can reveal more than 55,000 executives from hundreds of companies have received 100% funding to take postgraduate apprenticeship standard courses. Well, there you go. Basically, what they're saying is fat cat bosses are getting a free education but calling it an apprenticeship. Uh, last but not least for now, the Daily Star. School holes hit. White Easter. Snow way. Our weather is not for snowflakes. A new polar blast is threatening to bring a white freeze to... God, I had to do some heavy lifting to get that one up. <laughs> Time to ask the Easter Bunny for a chalk ice. There you go. It's going to be a freezing Easter, folks. We'll need more uh, Easter eggs to make us happy. OK, those are your front pages. Let's get reaction now from uh, my fantastic panel. I'm delighted to have with me uh, the wonderful Emma Burnell, journalist and political consultant, Neil Parrish, former Tory MP, and David Aldroyd Bolt, historian and political commentator. Um, let's have a look at this. Slightly worried about Neil Parrish, this uh, bank that's collapsed in the United States. Uh, it seems to be very tied in with the tech industry, the tech sector in this country. Are we looking at Credit Crunch 2.0? Yeah, we've got to be careful because one of the things I've, being a farmer, you say, I've always said that we've never, we don't lend money, um, we lend money on collateral. And a lot of these companies don't get the money they need. And so therefore, you know, high tech companies need a particular type of bank. Um, we've got to actually get more money out to those developing businesses and that will really help growth in the economy. So it's not just this bank, we've got to look at many others and actually get the, get banks lending so that you so there is a certain they, they're, they're risk adverse banks by their very nature and I understand that and and this is the problem and, and so therefore you know these companies and people will not be paid naturally if this particular bank has not helped but it is wider than this and we've got to hope that this uh, and don't forget as interest rates start to rise and they've already risen um, you when we had interest I can remember interest rates of 10 12 15 percent and yeah. everybody sort of throws their hands up in horror but what you've got to remember then the amount of capital we were borrowing was much less. 
And so therefore now there's a ratcheting process. And I think, you know, this is a wake up call to, to, to make sure that the banks, one, are, are solid, but two, can actually lend and actually we get the economy going. So it'll be interesting to see what the Chancellor says about this in his budget, because this is one of my old chestnuts, this is. I really do feel that, that banks don't do their job in this country. Mm. Indeed. Are you worried about this banking collapse? Could it, could it be a repeat of the credit crunch, David? I'm, I'm worried that we'll, it will set once again the desperate precedent that if a bank collapses, the state should bail it out, which is already what's happening in the States, I'm afraid. The whole point of the system we have, the way it functions best, is when there is risk for the reward that you would uh, gain. And if you start saying that every bank that fails uh, will be bailed out by the state because other companies are going to be hurt as a consequence, you take away the whole moral hazard of the, of the system of capitalism. I'm deeply against this idea, because all it does is mean that people play fast and loose. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the US Treasury has got a very poor uh, record on this since 20. And I'm afraid our own Treasury has an equally poor record. The, the people who lend in this instance know precisely what the risks were. That uh, lending has gone wrong. They should be prepared to take that hit. And unfortunately, if there's a knock-on effect within the sector, well, then it should teach the rest of the sector to be a little more cautious. I agree with Neil that there needs to be specialist sorts of investment here. That should come from things like private equity. It shouldn't be from banks that are backed by the taxpayer. Uh, Emma, here's a story that will warm the cockle of many people's hearts. Uh, police are to be barred from recording non-crime hate incidents just because someone's offended. This under plans announced by Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, has endorsed new guidance that requires officers to prioritise freedom of expression over offensive, controversial or derogatory language. Your reaction? Yeah, I mean, I very, 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 very rarely say this, but I think Suella Braverman's probably right. Um, because you're an artist as well, you're, you're, you're a playwright and yeah. you appreciate freedom of expression. And I told you a filthy joke in the break as well. <laughs> I did, it was obscene and I would never repeat it. <laughs> well, only on my last day here at GBU. There you go. Um, I think I'm, I've really, really come to the opinion that criminalising um, offences mm. doesn't change minds. And actually, what we need to do to combat racism, sexism, homophobia is change minds and hearts. And largely, we have. There's been some polling recently that says we're one of the most liberal countries in the world. Um, you know, we really are and we've not... we've seen progress, what, in the course of our own lifetime? Absolutely. We're, we're, you're younger than me, but we're a similar vintage. Yeah. And through the 70s, 80s... I mean, what it meant to be gay in the 80s is worlds apart from now. Absolutely, without, completely. Without legislation. And that's not to say that there is no homophobia, but it is yeah. significantly lessened, and that's without, a great thing. without coppers turning up at your but front door. I just don't see how that changes the ultimate problem, which is the homophobia. I, I, it, it doesn't change hearts and minds, and it does, in fact, harden attitudes. Yeah. And I, I think all too often we've resorted to legalities rather than doing the harder work of campaigning and changing minds. Yeah, what do you think about this? A victory for freedom of speech? Oh, absolutely, and without question, I'm very glad to see a Conservative standing up for something that the Conservatives are supposed to believe in. Uh, this is an unmitigated victory. Uh, okay. This is something we should all celebrate. Let's see if it's actually uh, as great in the, in the actuality as it is in the talk. Uh, is, is this... Neil Parrish, I know you've, you've, you've left the Commons now, but is, is this a Tory party that's got its, it's, got its mojo back? Uh, we, we've got uh, a deal with Macron to stop the boats. It may or may not work, plus legislation. Uh, the nerves of the financial markets have been settled, and I'm sure they'll welcome what, what Jeremy Hunt has to say next week, if not businesses. Um, there's a sort of clear anti-woke agenda in, in, in uh, stories like this freedom of speech one. So do they have momentum? I think we're beginning to, and I think what I want to see, the next election is going to be a huge fight for the, for the Tory party, but I actually want to get, see them get, pull themselves together to make a fight of it, because then, you see, the, the pressure then comes back on Keir Starmer to actually show what he's made of and where his policies are. Well, I mean, are. if you think about it, it's been a seismic three weeks because we also had the Windsor framework. That's I mean, right. You know, and you see, I mean, into less than a calendar month. You know, I and mean, everybody thought that would be sort of blown to pieces, didn't they? Immediately it came out, but it wasn't. And of course, you know, the Democratic Unionists were sort of wrong-footed by it because they they have, they've got to have a platform to stand on, and that was about the only platform they had. And all of a sudden, it, the, the the plank was almost sawn off. They're not going to say very much until probably after the May elections. Well, yeah. But yeah, that's, the, a, that's the key to it. Do in you the think end. the DUP and the ERG will hold their noses and support 
the Windsor framework? I think the ERG will, um, because you've got sort of several members who have said something and others are, are quiet. Um, the DUP, the trouble the DUP have got, and I can be quite blunt about this, they've got themselves the wrong side of the argument in Northern Ireland. And so, therefore, they need something politically to hold on to during the election. Vote for us and, because you know... Because the DUP we, and it's, have lost support to hardcore yeah, because unions you see they're, they're, parties. Well, they're, 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 you see, I mean, rightly or wrongly, they, they were the wrong side of the argument in Northern Ireland uh, over, over, over Brexit. Uh, and well, they were fighting for the integrity of the United Kingdom. I know, but you see, that's what they fight for, and they fight for that alone. And you've got many unionists now in, in, in Northern Ireland that don't just vote for the union flag. They want other policies as well. And that's where the democratic unionists have got themselves out of step. Because if they were actually sort of, shall I dare I say it, a little bit more mainstream, instead of just concentrating on waving the union flag, I think you'll find... Because, you see, a lot of businesses in Northern Ireland actually welcome this deal because they've got, you know, they're, 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 the, the goods worlds. will go into Northern Ireland from Britain, uh, which are going to be sold in Northern Ireland without any checks. And then they, the others, so that, you know, like milk, for instance, is very often processed all around Ireland. That can move around through the, through the single market into the European Union. I actually think Northern Ireland, uh, economically, will do very well in the future. And it'll be great yeah. if it does, because, you know, it's lacked behind the rest of the UK for many, many years. Well, let's now. hope they get government back instalment as soon as possible. Well, Emma, what do you think? Um, do the Tories have momentum? I think their mad scramble backwards has been stalled a little. <laughs> um, I think that's as far as I'd go. They're stalled, yes. They stopped the bleeding. <laughs> they, they may have just about staunched the bleeding, but they're probably still missing several limbs. <laughs> um, <laughs> just I... but a scratch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, just tell us, you're giving what, us some what, great metaphors to What make. will be the challenge is, um, will they hold their nerve uh, after the local elections? Uh, if they hold their nerve under the... Which, that... will, be, which will be a bloodletting, won't I it? I suspect. Yeah. Now, if, if they turn on themselves again, they're toast. Right. Mm. If they hold their nerve and, and come together, they can make a fight of it. Uh, I think it's going to be a hell of a fight, and I think Labour has got every chance of winning. But it, but if they actually pull themselves together, you see, it mean politics is like a seesaw. At the moment, Makes you, you know, say. they're right on the ground, mm. and, and all Keir Starmer's got to do is sit on the top and say, yeah, 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 we do it all differently. Um, but but what is he going to actually do at the end of the day? Um, you know, on the on the on the migrant crisis, on all of these things, on the economy, all of these things. There's no real policy there. There's no real meat. You know the green economy. Yes, well, we can all we can build some more turbines and we can put some more solar panels. But you know, seriously, what is the alternative? And and I think when you actually start to analyse what are the policies of of a, of a Labour government, then I think the opinion polls will start to tighten. And and I think, but if the if the Tories actually tear themselves to shreds and keep on shooting each other, and which we're very good at, <laughs> um, then I think we will be toast. Well, there you go. Never underestimate the ability of the Tory party to start a fight with itself in a locked room. <laughs> and this is why Keir Starmer doesn't have to elucidate policies. It's yeah. why he doesn't That's have to right. be explicit, because there is every likelihood, I think, that after the inevitable bloodbath of the May elections, mm. Boris Johnson will, and his allies will attempt to stage a comeback. Sooner will either be put to the test or will be booted out. The Tories will look even more right. ridiculous in the public eye than they do already. Well, that would be fake. And it paves the way to Keir Starmer's winning the next Ra election. Race to the bottom. Uh, okay. There you go. Well, lots more to come, including the Times newspaper next. Also, has Britain become a rude country? Country and the nightmare of trying to pay for parking with your phone. Have you done it? It yeah. doesn't work. We'll discuss that next. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236 and UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio with the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. 
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven, on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit off. Well, you are. You, you, my, you, no. my political ambitions are <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at six o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, it's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Here they are. Uh, welcome back to Mark Dolan tonight, and we've got more front pages. Let's have a look at The Times, tomorrow's Times newspaper, and they lead with this particular headline. Uh, BBC bosses seek truce to get Lineker back on side. Uh, also, MI5 will help firms fend off Chinese and Russian spies, and Treasury scrambles to protect tech firms after bank collapse. Uh, look, we're going to keep it a Lineker-free zone for the rest of the show. <laughs> Hurrah. Plenty of that young man. Uh, but let's get reaction to the other stories of the day from historian and uh, political commentator David Aldroyd Bolt, former Tory MP Neil Parrish, and journalist and political <laughs> consultant and teller of very rude jokes, Emma Burnell. <laughs> she hasn't now, told us enough. Uh, <laughs> does this irritate you as much as it irritates me? Pay-as-you-go parking machines are being removed from city streets in the UK. Brits will now have to juggle 30 different parking apps on their phone simply to pay for parking. Is this progress or the highway to hell? <laughs> uh, nice work. Whoever wrote that, pay rise. Um, David, have you paid for parking with your phone before? Yes, and I must say I haven't found it terribly difficult. It's a science. I don't think it you is. You need like a degree. You just f put in the number and there you go. What I really dislike about it is that it's yet another step down the road towards the fact that we have to do everything for ourselves all the time in the name of better service. Uh, and I, I just think, can we please have some aspect of customer service that in fact serves us, that is not us serving the companies that we go to uh, for their goods and services? I mean, it's not that difficult. You download an app and most with yeah, one that's app or another. You're, like, you're yeah. a groovy 20. I'm really not. I'm a total Luddite. I despise technology's interference in nearly aspect, every aspect of our life. But this one isn't too bad. What I do dislike about it is the, is the imposition it has on those who perhaps don't have smartphones, those who perhaps don't want to have them. There should remain a, an analogue uh, well, choice. Well, there should, but, but not just... It, I mean, I've got a smartphone, I've got internet yeah. access, and when you go to a different borough or a different yeah. county... You find that the Ringo app doesn't work and yeah. you've got to get paid by phone. No, no, it's a different one. Yeah. That's right. And then you've got, you know, parts of the rural areas where you haven't even got coverage. Yeah, you know? that's and true. I mean, yeah. the, whole, the whole thing's crazy. Um, we're also doing away with cash all the time. Um, and so, therefore, you know, I mean, all right, yes, I'm older and, and I don't like these damn things. Um, and, you know, you land up sort of either, either paying the wrong amount or not paying anything at all. And, and the trouble is it will hit the older generation. And if you're not careful, we'll all start getting fined because we haven't paid for our parking um, and I think it will become a, a real issue and, and I think you know we 
technology is a marvellous thing, provided everybody signed up to it. Uh, but a lot of people aren't, and, and I think I, I they've got to be careful. I quite like the simplicity of a pound mm. coin in the machine. Yes, in the machine. A piece I mean, of paper. I never carry cash anymore, so I, I'm quite happy with <laughs> like, this. Like King Charles. But very much. Me and King Charles are completely like the, the exact same person. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do find the fact that it's a different app at every car park annoying. Mm. But I also, I, I do want to just say something about older people. Both my parents are in their 70s. They've both had smartphones for at least a decade. I think we, we, we tend to say, oh, these older people won't be using this. People who are still driving are extremely likely to have a mobile phone, a smartphone. Mm. Um, I think we can be overly patronising to the elderly at times on, on some of this stuff. Um, I uh, agree with that, yeah. But it's not just about yeah. the elderly, it's about those who, for whatever reason, choose not to use this technology. Exactly. Because they would rather it's not, it's not use it. Yeah, I mean, I think you have yeah. to have another option. There must, there, I think they, in fact, um, I would go I've, as far I've to say... But I've very rarely been yeah. to a car park where it's paid by phone, where there isn't also a yeah. machine but that you can stick to. There always seems to be different rules. There's sometimes yeah. you've got to pay when you leave, sometimes yeah. right. you've got to pay up front. That's right. Uh, I'm expecting you know. masked bandits just to take... You know, I, mean, I, I mean, I went to the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital days to see a friend, and, and you know, on the way out there, you've actually got to pay on the way out, and then you mm. put, and, tap and in your number, the, it works out. You've been in, uh, in, in on, you know, they, it, it's registered your your number. Another time, yes. you've got to register it as you go in. Um, they are not all the same, and, and I'm not patronising older people. There is just some older people can't do it, um, and 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 won't be able to do it, and like I said, well, won't I, necessarily I, have yeah. the coverage. And I think you know, we just got to be careful. We're we're making everything so uniform, you know. We no, none, nobody can be different anymore. Um, everybody's got to do it this way. Um, I think that's it's, wrong. Yes, it's it's technocrats, isn't it? Really, you know, and, and we are slaves to the this, march of the cashless society. This digital device, yeah. Uh, that's the problem. All in the name of convenience. Now, a remote worker was rolling his eyes and huffing at a woman and her child in a cafe whilst he was on a work call. She had the temerity to take her child to a cafe. Uh, why have we become so rude and impatient in recent years? Uh, have we become a less tolerant country? What do you think about that, Emma? Have we got ruder? No, I don't think so. I mean, that guy is rude. But I'm, when I'm in a cafe and there's a kid there, I'm all, I pay peekaboo. Um, you know, I, I think... You scare them off. <laughs> I mean, I scare children anyway, but... <laughs> But only no. only in, uh, when it's dark. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. No, I mean, I think um, we're, we're not a ruder country. I think there's a lot of, of dismissal of modern Britain that is really unfair and unfortunate. Uh, you know, we are the country we make ourselves. Yes, um, and we've made yeah. ourselves horribly rude, don't you think? When you take public transport now, it is to me, in the ten years I've been in London, an, an absolute truism that it is much ruder, that people are much more discourteous, that the instances of antisocial behaviour are more noticeable and no longer uh, contained to the night hours uh, daily. I, just the, the absolute discourtesy with which people treat staff in shops seems to be much more apparent than it used to be. Uh, I, I think that there is this really hard edge to people now that didn't used to be there quite so much. I think this was exacerbated by uh, the effect of lockdowns and of people being uh, withdrawn from, or rather being made to withdraw from society and coming back into it not feeling quite so comfortable. But it's it just seems to me a much less friendly uh, yeah. and a much less open... David, I think Come to Leighton, we're yeah. lovely. I, I, we're very, I, I, very think, I think it's mixed. I think when it comes to children, I think actually we're much more tolerant of children than we were. I mean, I mean I, I've travelled a lot yes. on the continent yeah. and, and, you know, the Italians and others love children and they can do what they like. Um, I think the Brits are better on that. But I think there is, um, especially in London, actually, sometimes when you're travelling, there is, a, there is a problem. But, you know, I think people... I think people just... I think lock, what lockdown did is it shut everybody down and they, they weren't able to communicate. Yep. Um, and I think, you know, we've just got to get back to actually living with each other. Um, but I don't think we are a particularly rude country, but I think there were there were one or two individuals perhaps could, dare I say it, need to be um, a little bit politer. Well, well, I couldn't have a more polite panel tonight. Loved every moment. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps we were too polite. Uh, most importantly to you, thank you for your company all weekend. Headliners is next, and I'm back on Friday at 8. See you then. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News.
It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. I, 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 Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, welcome back. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Talks between Gary Lineker and the BBC are moving in the right direction following a second day of disrupted sport coverage. The broadcaster says there are hopes of a resolution soon, but not all issues are fully resolved at this stage. Football coverage on TV and radio was hit across the weekend as pundits walked out in solidarity with Lineker. He was taken off the air for criticising government's asylum plans. Sunday's edition of Match of the Day ran for just 15 minutes without commentary or analysis. Former BBC executive Roger Bolton says the controversy is diverting attention away from the real issue. It's this argument about what is impartiality and who must be impartial that is a wider question. Of course, the other thing that's happening here is the political parties, particularly the government, governing parties, see this as a wonderful opportunity in the culture wars to create trouble and divert attention from the fundamental issue here, which is illegal immigration, which is extraordinarily difficult to deal with. The Prime Minister is due to arrive in California shortly ahead of unveiling plans to supply Australia with nuclear-powered submarines. Rishi Sunak will meet his Australian counterpart, Anthony Albanese, and the US President Joe Biden to flesh out a major defence deal as part of the 2021 AUKUS Pact. Uh, Sunak is expected to unveil a new review of defence and foreign policy as well, which will set out the UK's approach to threats from Moscow and the growing threat from China. At least 200 tech and science companies in the UK are in danger of being affected by the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. That's according to data from BVCA, the industry body representing venture capital investors. Now, the lenders' UK subsidiary goes into insolvency this evening. Bank of London and Oak North Bank are among several parties exploring buying the company's British operations. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, says the government is working at pace on a plan to prevent affected businesses from going bust. The Health Secretary has criticised junior doctors for failing to call off this week's strike action. 
writing in The Telegraph, Steve Barclay described the 72-hour walkouts as incredibly disappointing. Members of the British Medical Association in England will launch a three-day strike on Monday. The union says junior doctors have suffered a 26% real terms cut to their pay since 2009. And Hollywood stars have uh, begun arriving ahead of the Oscars, which gets underway shortly in California. It will face stiff competition that is the favourite, uh, which is everything, everywhere, all at once. Stiff competition from the Banshees of Inishirin, which has a record nine nominations for an Irish film and also All Quiet on the Western Front. Bill Nye is up for Best Actor. Andrea Riseborough is up for Best Actress uh, in her role in the movie to Leslie. And it all gets underway at about midnight. This is GB News. Now it's time for headliners. Hello, I'm Leo Kearson. Welcome to Headliners, your first look at Monday's top news stories. Joining me tonight are two of the best comedians from either side of the Atlantic. We've got London's Josh Howey and Lewis Schaefer, all the way from New York. Before we get stuck into the rest of the stories, what have you two seen in the papers that, that has made you laugh? Josh, you I go first. saw a man, uh, this is in the Daily Star, basically go and kick over a little girl's um, snowman. Why? <laughs> Why did he do that? Did he have a reason? Was it I just for fun? I think it was really rubbish. It was just a bad snowman. It was a really, I don't know if we have a photo, if we could see it, but it was not a good look. But what was funny was it was caught on, you know, like one of those cameras. Right. Which have, you know, the, the front doorbell. Oh, the so ring. So saw some guy, like, yeah, here we go. There he, it is. He, he, he literally oh drove God. up, stopped the car, and then got out to kick over the, uh, the snowman. Now, I don't know if there's any proof that he knew it was made by a little girl. Yeah. Um, but well, they're so, generally not made by by adults. Maybe it just wants speak, a speak yourself. maybe it just wants a job with one of our woke institutions that, that pulls down statues but and he's showing his little audition for that. Yeah, yeah, he's going to send that that video in. Well, to be fair, the snowman was white. <laughs> <laughs> the truth Listen. is, it didn't look like much of a snowman. It's like a blob of snow. All right, well, yeah, so everybody didn't have any eyes. They didn't have any indication. Critic. Everybody's a critic tonight. Lewis, what, what have you seen that's funny? Well, I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's just one of those things that's just so ridiculous. It's in the Telegraph. It was in an article about how uh, Britain is the fast food capital of Europe, which we know that, right? And it's driving mental health crisis in some woman who's a clinical psychologist. Some woman. Some woman, because she's an idiot. She's basically saying, she's basically saying if you want to have increased brain health, eat sugars. Eat, eat raisins, cranberries, chopped apples, uh, oats, and she goes on and on about all the stuff that, that Lewis Schaefer knows is wrong. So junk food is making people unhappy? Is that what the, the article's saying? And, it's, it, and she's saying eat healthy food, but you're saying it's not, it's not healthy. No, I'm right. saying, they, she's saying junk, junk food is bad, but she's also yeah. saying food that we th consider to be healthy food you know is, is good, oats, is not good. Cranberries. But you've got is you follow good. this strange diet where you only eat meat. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't say that. Did I say that? You don't have to eat these things. Okay. Just don't eat plants. You know, I feel like I'm in the the beginning of a rom com, <laughs> and it's like you've got mail, right? And then we've got Lewis here with his meat, and then he's going to hook meat. up. He's going to meet this woman, this dark <laughs> woman, who with her with her vegetables and yeah. things like that, and it's going to be kismet. It's kismet. Kism or, or yeah. You're going to kismet on the lips. Anyway, let's have a look at Monday's front pages. The Daily Mail have, Will BBC do a deal today to end the TV standoff? Talking about the furore over Gally Gary Lineker there. Uh, the Telegraph is the same story. Lineker set to return as BBC bosses back down. The Guardian has, BBC bosses in race to end Lineker standoff and avoid staff rebellion. The Sun has the same story with slightly different words. Lineker back in the box. The Times has, are you getting bored of this yet? BBC bosses seek truce to get Lineker. And finally, the Daily Star saves us with something different. School halls hit White Easter. And those are your front pages. Let's have a closer look at those front pages. We begin with the Telegraph, Josh. So, yeah, Lineker set to return as BBC bosses back down. I don't know if I'm allowed to reveal this yet, but I don't know if this story is true, because I've heard that Lineker's coming to GB News. 
<laughs> Where he can tweet whatever he wants. Yeah. Except for da Dr. Matthew Sweet getting angry with him. Is he taking a pay cut? No, no, he's going to get more. <laughs> he's got yours, he's got all of our. <laughs> but it's worth it because he's yeah. a wonderful broadcaster. Uh, so here he is. This is a picture of him. Uh, I like how all the newspapers have gone with different expressions. They've got the same him coming out of his house, but they've all gone. So they, the Telegraph have gone with a very sort of determined, I'm going to bring down the Tory government look. Yeah. He's got his dog with him. Uh, I believe the dog is uh, not a British dog. I believe it's a immigrant dog. <laughs> uh, a legal, legal immigrant, though, I believe. Um, I don't know if you got that deep. That was a joke. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you look really well, serious. Well, can there we, for can a we discuss the actual story? Oh, of, God, the, he's going to go. Talking about, like, oh, you know, whatever. It's supposed to be a news, news is it, story. Is it, is it, like, oh, he's got a dog's is it, no, 